Welcome to another episode of Geeky Gentlemen. I am Sid Part 2. Joining me today is the superhero enthusiast Alexander Stevenson to talk about one of the lowest points of one of his favorite franchises. This will be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, I never really realized how big a uh, Star Trek fan Alex was. Like, I'd, I know I'd heard him say as much and, like, I'd heard him talk about it here and there. But then I found out that at one point he spoke fluent Klingon, and I'm like, what? <laughs> um, <laughs> or good enough. Yeah? Passable. Uh-huh. Passable, like conversational Klingon. Yeah, um, it's not exactly a skill that's particularly useful, so I haven't really kept it up. <laughs> what do you mean? You, I'm sure that could come in handy in a job interview. It's like, do you speak any other languages? Yes, Klingon. And you just kind of like say it real quick before they realize... It's like, oh, that's perfect. Wait a minute. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, I've got our nerd market totally covered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, I don't know, I imagine that could come in handy if you're, like, just really angry and you just need to yell something at someone. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> is everything but, in Klingon is yelled? <laughs> exactly. It's, it's like German. It just doesn't sound right unless you scream it. Um... <laughs> All the German people just left uh, after leaving their angry comments, proving my point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, everyone, uh, so today, yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, the the fantastic film that, that pleased uh, fans of both series uh, for generations to come, Star Trek Generations. Because that's what it did, right? Clearly. Uh <laughs> It's it's strange to say that because on some level Generations is my favorite of the TNG movies, but that's only because really? it's the least bad. Oh, okay. Well, that's a great great sign for for things I get to look forward to. Um, Granted, everybody likes First Contact. I don't like it as much as everyone else does. I've kind of recently come around on it somewhat, but okay. Um, Generations definitely feels the most like the TV show. Yeah, I, d- I definitely get that feeling. It does it? It's weird because you hear the idea of the film, and I mean, all I've ever heard about it is okay, it's it's Kirk and Picard on the same mission, basically. And I guess part of me is surprised that it's not a full-on time travel story. I mean, it kind of is, but not in the way you'd think. Um, you would kind of think it would be like a movie version of. Uh, the TNG finale, all good things, where instead of the p- different Picards in different timelines, it's Kirk in the past and Picard in the future, and then or there's some sort of thing that they're both investigating that connects them across time. Yeah, something like that, or, or just, you know, the one of the Enterprises just goes into the past and then can't get back for whatever reason, and it's up to the other Enterprise to help it. Something like that, I'd assume... But no, it's it's really just uh, it's a really unique approach. I will give it that much. It's a, a really clever approach, and I don't think the movie gets overwhelmingly bad until we get what we're waiting for to happen on screen. Um, you know, because like the the whole movie, you're waiting to see Picard interact with Kirk, and then when you finally get that, that's when it really starts to go downhill. But if you leave Data aside. I think the rest of the movie is actually fairly good. Um, it's it's up, it, it, you know, ignore the data stuff, because my joke is that he's just the annoying 90s kid, because yeah. they didn't feel like bringing Wesley Crusher back. Um, he's the John Connor of this movie. Yeah, 
exactly. Um, <laughs> you leave data aside. The movie's actually pretty, pretty cool, pretty compelling, and. Until you get to the Kirk stuff, and then it just completely falls apart. Um, I don't, and that's I don't just know that I hundred percent agree with that. Like I like, I like some of the stuff in the Kirk and Picard interaction scenes, but it's like that's not what we wanted from this movie. We didn't want to see them just kind of stand around and have a conversation and ride horses and stuff. Well, like for me, what I, I enjoyed their interaction, but it's just. As soon as Picard gets there, you kind of slap Kirk's character in the face. Um, Because there are so many episodes about Star Trek, or in the original Star Trek, that are just about, you know, duty over uh, self. Um, And you you really do have Kirk faced with that situation again, and he just decides, nah, fuck it, I'm going to be selfish this time. And I just, like, I'm not a huge Kirk fan or anything, but ouch. Um, it's just character assassination. I can see it from that perspective. I mean, they try and make the Nexus out to be like it it gives you whatever your your greatest fantasy is. And I never, like, I don't think that's really supported by the fantasies that we see in the movie. It seems to be sort of what you're thinking about lately. And, like, Kirk had been thinking yeah. about how, well, he didn't have a family, and so he's back to this place in his life where he had that choice. Um, so he kind of gets to to make the other choice this time. And, you know, Picard was thinking about the loss of his family and how, you know, the Picard family is going to die if he doesn't have any children. Yeah, and I think that'd be an interest. That was an interesting idea to to kind of parallel the theme of generations. Um, The title is fitting, if nothing else. But at the same time, it's just they slap Kirk's character in the face and then they have him get over it in, like... I talked about this over Twitter. Um, the biggest problem with Star Trek is every problem for every character had to be solved in 40 minutes. Um, mm-hmm. And, like, people just got over these, you know, really huge, hurt, like, personal hurdles in 40 minutes. And that always just bugged the crap out of me. Yeah. And this, like, you know, fast forwards that to literally Kurt gets over a hurdle by going over a hurdle. Um <laughs> <laughs> like really just a couple jumps over a ravine and that's that's all it takes well I mean he, he explains why he says you know every time that he made that jump it scared the hell out of him but it didn't this time so like because he knows it's fake and so there's no challenge for him there and I guess he realizes he can't actually be happy in the Nexus because it's not going to give him the thrill of you know getting out there and making a difference, as he says. Yeah, I think I think I got that, but it's just, it's so quick. Yeah. I mean, it's... That and just the way Kirk is there, like, it really bothered me because, you know, Picard shows up in the Nexus and then a shadow of Whoopi Goldberg, whatever, um, tells him that, that Kirk just... Sense. Yeah. Tells him that Kirk just arrived himself. I'm like, well, why did he just arrive? That's... Dumb. Um, I guess it's because it, it's the the time has no meaning thing. But then but, why but didn't the problem with the Nexus is it's just it's so abstract and they don't really explain very clearly how it works. So it just gives them license to do whatever they want, and it doesn't necessarily make sense. Yeah, it's not just that it doesn't make sense. It's just like, well, why did it? have to only be, you know, he's there for 10 minutes. Um, why couldn't it be something like, you know, he's been there and he's gone through and decided to live that life that he'd always dreamed of? Yeah, that would have been the more interesting thing. And then him him and Picard would have had something to bond over because Picard went through the exact same experience in the inner light. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and it's just, it's so weird that they just gloss over that, and, and it really just feels shoehorned. Like, you know, I, I always talk about character development in Star Trek kind of feeling really shoehorned, and this is, like, the moment where it happened the most, because it's like, you know, just jumping over a creek a couple times yeah is, is all it takes. And I'm like, I, I, I like the intention, I just, the execution is terrible. Um... And so that's that's why I'm like, okay, up until they enter the Nexus, the movie has its problems. Data, you know, mm-hmm. big fuck, 
red blinking light. But overall, I think it's still a fairly solid flick up until that point. Um, even the space battle with the Klingons is pretty cool. Um, yeah, I think the movie definitely, once it gets to that part, slows the hell down. And it, it, it feels very kind of drawn out. And it's not particularly exciting or anything for a big chunk of the movie there. I don't know if it's that it's not exciting that's my problem. It's just that it's it's insultingly bad. Because, um, like, the whole point that Whoopi Goldberg makes, or Geigen, whatever, I don't care, um, makes to Picard before he goes hunting for the Nexus is, if you go, you won't want to come back. Nothing else will ever compare to it. And, like, he, he clearly has a very touching moment with the you know, realization, this could be my life, I could have my family. But it doesn't really seem to bother him that he's going to leave it. He he realizes he has a duty to do, and he just goes on doing it. I'm like, really? That's, you know, you're... It's it's that kind of like uh, uh, Black Mercy thing in Superman. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know, just, it really bothers me that he's just so... It, that the character development just kind of stops. Um... That's fair. I mean, like you said, that's that's always kind of been an issue, especially with TNG, because it was so much more episodic. Um, mm-hmm. DS9 is a little bit different, but um, it gets more that way over time. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Just like, just that that it's not very, it's not setting up, it's not delivering on what it's setting up very well. Um, is is I think the biggest problem with the third act, and I think that's where this movie for me at least, really breaks down is the third act. Um, because then I think everything just goes wrong. Like, we have no idea what um, Malcolm McDowell's character is experiencing in the Nexus. We're just told that it's amazing. I'm like, yeah. ah, well, couldn't we have seen what he was doing? Um, I just I just feel like you, you could either cut time from some other sections in this movie or at the very least just extend it another, I don't know, 20 to 15 minutes. Um, it was sort of a strange use of the Duras sisters, too. Uh, see, I don't know what they've been doing in the... I, I don't know what they did in DS9. I think the last time we saw them in TNG was when Warp's son comes back in time, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, like that... So, I mean... They weren't, they they weren't really, in DS9, as far as I remember. Uh, there was... I don't know if they were in DS9 specifically. I just remember in that episode, Riker says something to the effect of they did something on DS9. They were caught, do- they were caught doing something on DS9. No, maybe there was um, an episode. In, I don't tend to rewatch the early seasons of DS9. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. It's just it's one of those things where, like, they were okay-ish, I guess. I don't really... I don't know, like, I'm not quite sure what exactly they wanted. Well, they um, they're, they just want to take over the Klingon Empire, and it's like it's this simple little motivation that just kind of has them able to be a part of the movie, but they don't really add anything. Yeah, um... It's, it's just weird, because they, like, they establish that you can't drive a ship into the Nexus, but only a planet... Only someone on a planet can enter the Nexus, but then I'm like, well, how did the ships in the beginning of the movie get in there? Yeah, There's a and like, lot when the here. thing hits the Enterprise B, how does Kirk get sucked into it? Like, it just, they're not consistent with it, and it doesn't make sense. Yeah, I think that's the, the, the Nexus is the problem, and it's like, it's such a weird plot contrivance for a series that already has time travel yeah. built in, firmly established. Um, so I, I just don't really get where they're going with some of that stuff because I don't know. You just you see characters time traveling constantly. Um, I would actually probably make the argument that Star Trek under utilizes its time travel from what I've seen so far because there's quite a few episodes, particularly of. Uh, TOS, where I'm like, why didn't you just make this a time travel story? This is really silly otherwise. Oh, um, you'll love Enterprise. <laughs> oh, yay for me. Fucking A, that's exciting to hear. Um, <laughs> uh, I keep, like, everyone keeps going, oh, just wait till DS9. I'm like, yeah, but then I got stuff after that that I'm, I get to look forward to. Um, 
that I've never heard anyone say anything good about. Um, there are good things to be said about Voyager and Enterprise. It's just, on the whole, they're not nearly as good. Okay. I, that's a positive way to spin it. Um, you should just write political speeches for, like, you know, economies collapsing and stuff, Alex. Um, Keep calm and carry on. Right. Anyway. So, all right, let's let's kind of get away from the Nexus. Cause I, keep, I just keep like. Well, can I say what? one last thing about it? I guess before we move on, and that's the sure, the sure. real big gaping plot hole in this movie, and that Picard can exit the Nexus at any time. It's like, why didn't you go back before? You know, the, the like, fight on the planet, or or just go back and you know like not let him on off the Enterprise. Yeah. That, one point or whatever. It's also weird that, like, there's a scene on 10 Forward with Gigan in it and Malcolm McDowell's character, and she doesn't feel the need to let Picard know that he's one of her race. Because they don't find that out until after he's left, or after he's kidnapped Jordy. Um, yeah, because they're, sort of, they're sort of adding in a lot of stuff in this movie about the Elorians. Like, we knew they were... They were an old species, and the Borg drove them out of their, you know, planet or, or group of planets. Um, and so they sort of became refugees in the galaxy. Um, and then mm-hmm. it's like they add in, like, I didn't think we needed to to see that. And so it's it's adding in stuff to Guinan's backstory that doesn't necessarily fit all that well. Well, I mean, all we really see is that she's on one of the refugee ships... Uh, as it enters the Nexus and gets saved by the Enterprise B. Um, gets saved by Ferris Bueller's best friend. Um, yeah. Th- that you, was Cameron. so... Yeah, that was so weird. Like, I kept looking at the guy, I'm like, wait, that's not Ed Norton, is it? Like, it's, it looks... <laughs> they look so much alike. Um, I was like, that's a really young Ed Norton, or I just... I recognize this guy from something. Um, no, but like... I, I didn't mind that part of it. It's it's a nice way to kind of connect them because, I mean, we have Vulcans who live for, you know, hundreds of, like, what, 200 years is supposed to be their average lifespan. Yeah. Um, and so that TNG definitely got some mileage out of that with Spock's dad uh, and having Spock come on the show itself, too. Um, but, I don't know, it's it's certainly a clever idea i guess to try to utilize that but i don't think it's done very well just because they don't really i think do enough with it because she's just not a very big part of it she's just there to be you know the exposition machine yeah and i mean guidance has always been the you know she's the bartender she serves the kind of the role of counselor which is like something that gives troy even less of something to do um yeah <laughs> And, like, yeah, she's not a central character. It would be sort of weird to make her a central character to the movie. So it's like, I don't I don't know why they needed to connect Sauron to her. Mm-hmm. Like, why couldn't Sauron have been human? Well, I guess you just need that... You need something to bridge the timelines. Um, and so, like, I mean, you could have maybe made Sauron a Vulcan, and it could have been interesting to see a Vulcan be so obsessed with something. Um, but I guess we kind of got that in Star Trek V. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, never mind. Um, here's here's my question, though, just real quick, since we're, we're dealing with the movie called Generations. What's up with all the TOS movies having, like, this theme about being old and useless? Um, like, I, I just don't get that. It's, it's such a weird running theme in all those movies that, like, you know, the that in some way or another, Kirk and, and company just are, you know, an old generation. They're not cut out for this anymore. Um, well, I think it's just because the cast was older and it's like, why would all these old people be running around on a starship? Maybe. I just I always thought it was really strange um, that it keeps coming up over and over again. I'm like, didn't we solve this with the first movie? Yeah, uh, like, I'm pretty sure Kirk was kind of okay with his mortality at a certain point. Yeah, I don't know. I just thought that was really weird. Um, anyway, 
I don't know. Like the you you make a really great point about Guy can be in there. And I don't know how necessary she is, but you do t- definitely need something to besides that. Like if you're gonna have a villain, which I guess Malcolm McDowell's character is, which I mean, way to not use Malcolm McDowell as a very good villain. Yeah, um, that's another thing worth mentioning. Is like great to have him in a Star Trek movie. Fantastic actor, but totally underutilized. Yeah, I mean, he's got, like, I like his scene with Picard, and I like that, you know, he's the one guy who Picard's speeches ha- apparently have no effect on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just keeps doing his thing. I feel like, you think that he'd be distracting, if nothing else. Um, like, I think he says, nice try, or something, at one point. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. Um, I don't know, I, I guess I like that you put Picard in a situation where making a speech doesn't do him any good. Um, that was kind of clever, because, I mean, that's what... I guess that's kind of what um, Kirk's always been good at, is, you know, just what, like rabbit-punching people, just, you know... Drop kicks and karate chops. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, just like that, like, you're in a conversation with him and he'll just punch you in the face real quick. Um, like, Kirk's the guy who, who goes out swinging before the final bell. Um... And and so I guess it's it's kind of a nice dynamic to have a, a villain who's who you can't talk out of anything um, because he's obsessed. But yeah, I just I don't think that Malcolm McDowell's very well utilized in this. I like that his character is, I suppose, on some level a hedonist. Because like if you've ever taken a philosophy course, you know you always get question get asked that question at one point of like if you had the choice to go into some you know, a machine that would give you total pleasure or whatever you wanted, um, and you knew you were never going to get taken out of it, like, would you choose to do that? And mm-hmm. Soren chooses to. So that's yeah, interesting. I, There's some sort of, like, potential there for discussing the human experience, but it's not handled well. Yeah, and that's the thing that gets me is, like, there's so much of Star Trek that's kind of like that, where we constantly see the crew, I mean, even in the the pilot with Pike, um, you know, he's given the option of, oh, you'll get to live comfortably, we can make you believe this is any kind of world you want it to be, we can give you a beautiful woman, she can take any form that you wish, blah, 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 and he still refuses to accept it because, he's, you know, he's got duty to live up to, and, and there's tons of episodes with Kirk about that. Um, the one where the, with the plants that make Spock cry, I think, or yeah, something like that. Um, with the plants that just kind of spray you in the face. Oh, right. Um, like those, uh, there's so much about like, oh, it doesn't matter if there's no, if it's not real, it's not worth doing kind of mentality in Star Trek. Um, and I don't know, the, the Nexus is a weird Thing to use and like it's such a strange thing because I'm trying to not talk about that but it keeps coming back um the, I mean that's kind of it is the story that they chose wasn't very interesting yeah and it's it's just that they've already done it better yeah um because I think everyone kind of had that thing even Picard to one extent um had that, like, choice to live comfortably or to be right, and that's where you get the whole four lights thing, um, which I want to make some jokes about at some point, but I don't know what I want to do. Um, I want to, like, get Cap to do another video with me, and I'm just going to, like, do a sketch and just be yelling, how many lights? Um, just something. I don't know what. (laughs) I could see you as a Cardassian torturer. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I'd fit that. Um, or Milan, you know, one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> or Milan would be the guy that just makes everybody quit. Um, <laughs> anyway, no, but like there, there's that that constant theme of of you know duty over self in Star Trek. Um, like that's when when Diana becomes a commander. Um, the whole thing is to learn to be willing to sacrifice your crewmen for the good of the ship because you, your duty over what you value is more important. Um, and that's there in the Wrath of Khan, too. That's the, Spock that, uh, the choice that Spock makes. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's such a consistent theme through Star Trek. And then to see it handled so poorly with Kirk is the thing that really pissed me the hell off. Um, I, I just... 
I'm not a huge Kirk fan, but there are things to admire about him, certainly. And to see, I really do feel that was character assassination to have him, like, say that line. As far as history is concerned, I'm dead. So who am I to argue with history? I'm like, ouch. Um, yeah. Because I know there are, like, a lot of really big Kirk fans, and they must have been pissed off by that. But not only by that, but by the fact that until, what, 09, Kirk was dead. Um, after that. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, like, they could have played it in such a way, too, if they'd used your idea um, of he'd been there a long time and gotten used to it. Like, if he if he had gone through that, like, I could understand him maybe being reluctant then, but with him only having been there for 10 minutes and not really even, you know, having explored the house and stuff, because, like, he's looking around and being like, I gave this clock to Bones. Um, he doesn't yeah. even know what's there. Uh, mm -hmm. It just doesn't doesn't connect. Yeah, it's, it's a really weird... Um, I, I watched through Nostalgia Critic's review of this just to... I, I like to watch his stuff, just try to get a, a bead on how other people feel about it, and I think he does a fairly good job at least making it entertaining while he makes fun of stuff. But, um, like, he, he calls that scene with Picard and Kirk in the Nexus somebody's bad fan fiction. Um, kind of. And I'm inclined to agree with that. Yeah, that's, that's kind of fair. Um... I guess another thing that's really weird, just like if you were gonna do Kirk and Picard together, which I mean, slash fiction, have your way with that. <laughs> um, but if you're gonna do them together, it's weird that they're not on a ship. Because um, like, Salch Critic made that joke too. Captain Picard and Captain Kirk, two of the greatest starship captains ever, are cooking eggs. Um, it's like, yeah, that's kind of a wasted opportunity and then they're like you know fighting and stuff and and he makes the other point of like wait if if they're not doing too well and kirk has to like risk his life to go get this remote control thingy couldn't they just wait till the nexus comes back around again yeah. and then start over um It'd be like a video like, game right yeah it's like video game reset button this is the movie to make a video game out of there you go yeah. um <laughs> please please don't um <laughs> No, I just I thought that was really strange to, to have because I think that's part of the the thing that people really like about Star Trek when it comes to action is, you know, like the really clever battleship style um, combat, and instead and, and not particularly their you know fighting action scenes because that's never particularly great. Um, well, I think a way to to distinguish the two captains as well would have been to see Kirk do things his way and Picard do things his way, and they both work for their specific part of the mission, and mm -hmm. that sort of shows how they're both valid leadership styles, and fans don't need to argue who's better, Kirk or Picard. Yeah, I agree, because it, it's such a weird thing um, to go from Kirk, who, you know, would... Kirk's a, like that Han Solo kind of character where... He's a space he thinks, Yeah, if he thinks someone's going to shoot him, he'll shoot first. And Picard's always willing to try to reason it out and stuff, sometimes to his own uh, danger, to his own detriment, because I think he's lost crewmen and stuff because he he tried to reason for too long. Um, but at the same time, it's it's so weird to see those two together and then not have them deal with that issue. Because um, you get the beginning of the movie where Kirk comes onto the ship and and you know Ferris Bueller's friend Cameron says. Oh, I read your adventures when I was a schoolboy. I'm like, how old is Kirk, first of all? Yeah. But also, um, like, if, if Picard grew up, like, you know, idolizing, uh, or entered the Academy idolizing Captain uh, Kirk, then, you know, you should do something with that as to why he's such a different captain. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's such a weird dynamic to to put on screen and then like there's it's just there's so many options you have and then they don't do any of the good ones um yeah and i mean like you could you could really have something interesting there because i think picard they show in the series was very much more like kirk when he was younger and then he had um Got the, stab in the yeah chest. he had the fight <laughs> with the nausicans um and that kind of turned him into a different person uh-huh um 
which I really like that episode, but once again, way too much on, on skipping on the character development. Because, um, like, in that episode, Q shows him what his life would be like if he didn't get stabbed through the heart. And he's he's still working on the Enterprise, but he's just, like, a science officer or something. Um, and he, he immediately decides this is not the life for him, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, fair enough, but couldn't you have made it a little more... A little less cut and dry, and maybe giving him a family in this version. Um, yeah, have it have it be a harder choice. Yeah, and and that's the thing I like. That's the thing that's that's interesting to me about Star Trek is seeing these characters. Because the one thing I will say about Star Trek is, no matter what, it's always fun to watch the characters. Um, no matter how bad the episode is. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it's it's always interesting to see characters push to like these you know monumental decisions where it doesn't matter that um that it's it's a really forced situation the point is that you don't have much time to to make a decision on these things and and i don't i don't know it's it's so it's so imbalanced to me i don't really know how to how else to go about it than that <laughs> I think you're right that, you know, they had a million options that were better than this, and they didn't take any of them. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the things you enjoy about this movie, exactly, since you say it's your favorite of the Next Generation films? Um, I like that we're on the spaceship from the TV show, and at least for part of the movie, they, they wear the uniforms. Like, it's just, a lot of it is just simple, basic, nerdy stuff of, I like stuff uh, that's the same. Um, yeah. <laughs> Because what the uh, the um, original series movies, I'm pretty sure it's a different set every single time, right? Close to it. Um, it's like the Enterprise was refitted. Really? Again? Yeah. Guys, just let it go. <laughs> <laughs> Build a new one. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I like a lot of the... Um, there's a lot of good moments to it. Um, there's some interesting... I don't know, just, like, construction of it. Like, I like that opening with, like, the champagne bottle floating through space, and you can't quite tell what it is at first. And then yeah. you sort of gradually understand what it is, and then, oh, it makes sense as it hits the ship. Like, that, that's yeah, a good that's, opening. Yeah, I was starting to wonder, is, like, the... Because I, no, I had no idea what the premise for this movie was beyond Kirk and Picard on screen. Uh, so I was starting to wonder, is it going to be, like, the... Enterprise got blew up, and and Scotty's gin collection is just floating in space or something. Um, like what's going on? Because like, I don't know. It's it's so weird. in um, in that one episode with the uh, people are frozen in TNG, and, and they're all, the crew's just like, oh, we don't have actual alcohol. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> um, Scotty just like there was a whole episode where it was this rousing success because he got a guy drunk. Um. <laughs> There's, I mean, there um, still is real alcohol in the future. It's just, you know, they serve our, synthahol in the ship. Yeah, I mean, I guess that makes sense. Um, and probably, my, I would my, imagine most people probably drink synthahol um, recreationally because it's like it, it'll get you buzzed, but it won't get you pissed drunk and yeah. you, you don't get hung over from it. No, well, that's, that's cool. I guess my thing with replicators is always, wait, why not just make, you know, yeah. the dilithium crystals and... There's, and there's a lot of things steps. that just don't make sense when you think about them, and, and you just sort of need to ignore <laughs> that stuff. Um, and and that's, that's true for every genre. Like, every genre oh, has yeah. its conventions that it relies on that don't necessarily make sense, but they need to be there for, um, you know, whatever thing is to work. I don't know, I want, like, a Doctor Who Star Trek crossover where he just says that, like, wait, wait, like, oh, so this makes food and stuff. Yeah, anything that we can teleport, we can replicate. So why not just use it to make starships? Yeah, that, build <laughs> just, a really big one. Yeah, yeah, just... just start cranking them out. Exactly. <laughs> I think it could work. Um, they don't seem that complicated if they have just, like, one in almost every room. Um... Yeah, I mean, like, all things considered, like, a starship is mechanical, so, like, mm -hmm. that would be simpler than creating food. Right, it would just right? Be, you would be creating more of it. Yeah, I know. It, it, 
And like it can't possibly be a not enough matter thing because they don't they they seem to say that the only thing replicators do is eat up energy. So yeah, I mean conceivably, because because they sort of run on similar technology to the transporter, so you should be able to take any kind of matter and turn it into any other kind of thing. Yeah, it's it's such a weird little thing where I'm like, wait a minute, clearly no one has thought this through. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, one thing I was disappointed by in this movie was n- not to see Q. I was really hoping for Q to show up in this movie. Um, I was just thinking because. about that, um, about how we got four TNG movies and Q wasn't in any of them. Yeah? Like, he's uh, the, you know, big antagonist in this, I guess, really the entire series. Mm-hmm. Um Because, I mean, he starts it off and ends it. Yeah. Um, you would think and like, the continuing not... voyages in the movies would be more of Q's trial. Yeah, and I mean, he might have been a better way to just get Picard and Kirk on screen at the same time, yeah. too. Um, if, like, you know, he just... If he decided to teleport one of the Enterprises somewhere and it's like, okay, and you can't use time warp because whatever reason. He's, like, going to just change the laws of the universe so that time warp doesn't work. Um <laughs> I, he says to change the fundamental law of gravity in one episode like it's nothing, so I'm assuming he has the capability to do that. Q is God, and he just okays whatever the Enterprise does, so that's that's just how I look at it. Yeah. Um, Wait, enough of this. I'm just going to prevent that from ever happening. Too much time yep. travel without my say. Yeah, exactly. Just like my, my running joke has throughout the... Uh, the process of watching Star Trek has just become to put in quotes, Star Trek is is more scientific than Star Wars, and then put something that is blatantly not even kind of scientific. Yeah. And Q is the ultimate example of that, because, I mean, they just hang out with God every few episodes. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, there was plenty of that in TOS as well. Oh, and yeah. And there's I mean, plenty of that with the prophets in, um, in uh, Deep Space Nine. Oh, exciting. Um... Like, it just, it just cracks me the hell up, because I'm like, yeah, God just shows up every other week. It's like, hey, guys, how's it going? Um, well, it's all about exploring the unknown. You know, God is everything that man isn't. Yeah, and I, I find that really interesting, and there's there's some great stuff in there. But the way I hear people make arguments like, oh, Star Trek's more scientific. I'm like, actually, I think Star Wars might be more scientific, um, because there's only, like, one or two things that are really out there. Everything else is pretty much just, you know day-to-day technology that we dream of um so that that just cracked me up I'm like wait a minute god shows up every other week and then a cat gets de-evolved into an iguana and i don't know yeah beverly crusher has sex with an 800 year old ghost um yeah i mean yeah star trek is not hard sci-fi by any means yeah, it just it cracks me up because people treat it that way, and it, and that's part of why I was thinking it'd be interesting to get into, and it's definitely not. Um, and and I I don't know why I why people put that out there about it because I think it's good on its own. But what's good about it is good on its own, regardless of that perception. Yeah, it's still cerebral um, sci-fi. It's just not hard sci-fi. Yeah, totally. Um, okay, the other thing that I got to talk about because I've alluded to it a number of times. Data's really annoying, man. And not like his classic charming kind of annoying from the series. Like, just 90s kid annoying. Um, I think it was weird to... I don't know, there's so much about this movie that's weird as far as, like, it just being the first TNG movie. Like, mm-hmm. I get that they try and put Kirk in there to kind of pass the torch, and, I mean, he doesn't in the movie. So, they kind of failed even on that level. But they try and pay off... <laughs> Data's character by putting in the emotions chip, which looks completely different than it did in the show. Um, <laughs> and in having him finally be, you know, human and having to deal with that, and that kind of parallels with, um, you know, what kind of Picard's going through emotionally, and he's having all these strong emotions and having to stay um, in charge and cool and calm and collected and run things. Um, but he's obnoxious. And it's not yeah. funny. Yeah. Um, I guess the thing for me is, like, I don't even really know if they truly deliver on Data's character. Um, like, the arc that they even attempt to set up for him about learning to deal with emotions. Because, 
I mean, you can make the argument that they do, but there's just so much time that passes with him that we're, where we just do not see him on screen that it, it makes it really hard to buy. It really feels like a uh, a shoehorned in subplot at certain points. Yeah. And then on top of that, he's being annoying. Um, so you don't want to see him, but you want to see him more. Yeah, because like that's the that's the thing that gets like first of all the emotion ship makes no sense. Um, no. Like, all right. So, what's the what's the name of the episode where he builds his daughter? Um, Offspring. Okay. So in that episode, Data builds himself a daughter, and is programming her by directly connecting her to his own mind. Let's just, neural net. There we go. And that's where she's getting her programming and, and her abilities to do all the things Data does. But then she ends up basically dying because she's starting to feel emotion and can't handle it. So, clearly, Data has the potential to feel emotion, because otherwise, where would she get it from? Well, or was it a case of her positronic matrix was more sophisticated in some ways than his was? Uh, I don't know how, because he says he bases all the designs off of himself. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to go back and rewatch the episode. Well, I just I thought that was so weird because they throw in that emotion ship just uh, like maybe a season later they throw that in and it comes back you know I think two times total just the the two lore episodes that you get after that um, it, it comes back and I'm like well why do you need a chip if he's already shown that it, like emotions are possible for him he just hasn't accessed them yet um, I I just thought that was so weird and then just the idea that you know you can get a chip and make it make you feel emotions is bizarre yeah. um like how do you program that <laughs> um i have no idea well and and i don't know like that gets into whole big issues of artificial intelligence and what that would be like and that's usually debated stuff on every level so yeah i know it's it's such a weird weird idea and like it i don't know i just feel like it's more interesting if he's already capable he just has to get to a point, because that's kind of what they do with his ability to dream. He's always been capable of dreaming, he has to just get to a point where that will get turned on for him. Um, and he doesn't get to that point, it just kind of happens by accident, but, you know, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Safety standards on the Enterprise suck. <laughs> well, I mean, like, you go back to the first Holodeck episodes and they act as if it's sorcery, like, they have no idea how it works. Nobody's ever used a holodeck before, and it's like, if this is some brand new technology and nobody knows how it works, maybe don't put it on a starship. Well, it's weird, because it, like, accidentally creates life, like, every time yeah. you use it. Um. So it's like, has nobody thought through the philosophical implications of this new technology before they started using it in, on every starship? Yeah, I mean, like, that... Certainly dynamics like that really work when you get to um, things like Jurassic Park. It's like, you just thought that you could. You didn't think whether or not you should do it. Um, <laughs> and that really works there. But this is Star Trek, where we're supposed to be like this super advanced civilization that considers all the outcomes. Um, and I'm like, no, you're obviously not, people. <laughs> oh, man. The Federation is only as advanced as the writers. Yeah. Yeah, that is a consistent problem, I can tell, because there's there's clearly a uh, a butting of heads of what the vision for the future really is. Oh, and, and, and when weird. you get to DS9, you'll definitely see that. Yeah. Um, it's it's such a weird thing, Star Trek, just overall. It's like, I almost want to watch, like, a, um, a Star Trek abridged, like, thing, where we just get, you know, here's the important the highlights. episodes... Here's the important episodes, here's the good movies, you know, enjoy. Because um, what was it? Uh, Futurama, I think, has my, my ultimate take on Star Trek, or at least at least the original series, but I think the, the franchise overall, which is Fry goes to talk to Leonard Nimoy about Star Trek, and they can't admit that Star Trek exists there in, in that version of the future. And he goes, come on, you know six movies, about 90 episodes, maybe 30 good ones. Um, <laughs> and that's that's kind of my takeaway. It's like, yeah, there's a lot of Star Trek, and about a third of it's really good. 
about a third of it is kind of okay, but problematic. Then about another third just is really hard to watch. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and we like it for the good third. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's the, the dynamic that I've, I've picked up on from people. Like, I, I think there's also kind of a... Um, Bill did an episode on uh, Power Rain uh, about Power Rangers on his show Demons from Outer Space, and he made the point about Power Rangers that if you don't get into it while you're young, you're probably never gonna like it. And I'm like, yeah. And if you don't get into it while you're young and stick with it, then you're probably never gonna like it. I'm like, I think I kind of feel that with Star Trek to a point. Um, That's probably you fair. Can, you can certainly enjoy things about it, and, and you can go through it and watch good things. And I still do plan on watching all of it just to have that little stamp on my nerd card. Yeah, um, get that, that nerd <laughs> merit badge. I'm not watching the animated series, though. You guys can go fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> it's got some good episodes. I'm sure it does. I'm like, three. Um, yeah. Kind of. <laughs> Uh, like it's, but I feel, feel like if you don't get into it while you're a kid, you know, watch it with your mom or dad or whatever, and then stick with it while you grow up, then it's really never going to work for you um, in, in the way that it does for, for, you know, the Trekkers, as it were. It takes a certain amount of just setting rationality aside and just enjoying it as a thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's, it's definitely not the most accessible thing in the world, though, I think. Um, it's it's certainly more so than some other shows I've watched, but there is a certain level of okay, you just got to get over a couple hurdles first. Um, yeah, but I mean, everything doesn't have to be mainstream and accessible, and that's that's admittedly part of the problem I have with you know a lot of the modern Trek movies mm-hmm. is you know they're trying to be mainstream to the point of it not really being very Star Trekky anymore. Yeah, and my thing with the the modern movies is I think if you just watch the um, TOS and the original movies, I don't think it's like super out there. It's it certainly breaks from the the point of like telling a moral tale in the first one, but you get a little more of that in the second one. But I feel like it's more Star Trek than people give it credit for. Yeah, I just I think the movies are like, especially the Abrams ones, like just aren't good movies on the level of movies. Mm, okay. Um, I don't know. Like, I don't want to get too much into the Abrams things, because I've got to rewatch those before I ever really put an opinion out about it. I'm actually waiting till the very end to rewatch those. Um, okay. Can I get through everything else? <laughs> Woo. Um. <laughs> Granted, if you do it that way, they might feel like a breath of fresh air. Probably. Um... I don't know. Should I watch Nemesis last? Because I hear that, like, part of Nemesis leads into Abrams. Um, well, I'd watch Nemesis before the Abrams movies. Yeah, I mean, but I, I meant before I get to the Abrams. Should I watch that before, or like, after Enterprise, or no? Um, that's actually a good question as far as, like, watch order goes. Yeah, I, I tried to pin that down, and, like... First of all, I got really annoyed at some... Like, every branch of fandom has those really annoying fuckers, but, you know, there's... God, just shut up sometimes, people. <laughs> I, I, I went on Google, and, and I found a Yahoo Answers page, because that's how the internet works, mm-hmm. about what order in which to watch Star Trek series and movies and everything. And I see a guy post my question on Yahoo Answers, and he goes, so... I know, the only thing I know about Star Trek is is a show about spaceships. And <laughs> I'm like, uh, yeah, so what order do I watch everything in, blah, blah, blah. And the very first person that replies to him goes, starships, not spaceships. I'm like, shut the fuck, fuck yeah. up, you ass. <laughs> you wouldn't know that. <laughs> um, no one in their right mind would know that if they haven't watched Star Trek. That's just a dick thing to say, and that in, that immediately makes people not want to watch your shit. Um, I have very little patience for nerd territorialism. Yeah, um, like that that thing just drove me crazy. You're driving like people away from something that you like. What's wrong with you? <laughs> it's like it's it's all for me. Um, yes, it's it's mine and no one else's. Yeah, okay, Gollum and or Larflees. Um, yeah. 
I mean, that's the thing. There's so many characters in in fiction who are stand-ins for the fans. Yeah. Or, or um, serve as that. Oh, I mean, D- Larfley's in Green Lantern definitely serves in, as that. Um, in his original book, Hal Jordan takes away his battery at one point, and Larfley's beats the crap out of him and says, It's in mint condition! <laughs> um <laughs> So that's Jeff John's little commentary on, you know, the, the super geeks. Um, <laughs> I almost kind of feel like Q in the series was, was that way. Because, like you say, he's God. And I think that's true. Um, but I think, like, Q was also sort of a stand-in for the audience. And the trial is like, okay, we're doing... We did this new Star Trek show. Like, how does it measure up? Did these people actually, you know, prove that they're these enlightened, um, you know, representatives of the best of humanity? Or didn't they? And at times, I seriously question how well they succeeded at that trial. Um, yeah. Particularly when when Diana's getting raped every other episode, and Riker's raping people every other episode, or at least being cu- accused as of much, and people don't really question it. Like, like there's there's certain things where if someone tells me my best friend is a rapist, I'm like, no fucking way. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's strange you know, how everyone everything. jumps to his defense. Yeah, it's it's weird. Um, people are just okay. We'll have a trial about it. It's like, wait, wait, shit, guys, really? You throw me under a bus like that? Like you're not even gonna like come to my aid on this at all? Um, then the Enterprise, or not the Enterprise, but the Starfleet, like having multiple battles with Data over whether or not he is autonomous. Yeah. Um, that's weird that they the question even has to come up. Um, well, you would have thought like, they would have figured that out before they let him join Starfleet. <laughs> Yeah, like, that that seems like a case, and, like, they talk about in that trial episode how the guy that's trying to, you know, open up Data, um, how he was the only member of the board to vote that Data shouldn't be allowed to join Starfleet. But more so than that, I mean, like, I'm not a proponent of machine thinking, but at the same time, the day my toaster says to me, Ian, I'm alive, please don't use me anymore... I'm not going to use my toaster anymore if that's not, a, like, a programmed-in thing for it to say, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, like, if someone, you know, puts a voice box in the toaster and does all that shit, of course I'm going to still use my toaster. It, it still wow the fuck out of me. Um, it's a great prank to use on somebody. Um, but, like, you know, you, you certainly get to that point where if something says, hey, I don't want to do this, then it's it's not a really big moral question. You shouldn't make them do that. Um, whether or not they are a machine, uh, that, that, that seems like the, the question isn't whether or not data thinks the question is whether or not he is autonomous and like he makes all his own decisions. Otherwise, no one tells him to make art. Um, so it's, it's just weird that they even address that. Like they even consider it. Um, yeah, but it's also a good episode. Yeah, it's it's such a weird thing. Like when you when you debate about it back and forth, it's like, well, is it, it's it's one of those things where, um, not marketing, but uh, audience over story, right? Um, or even if the story itself, like the, or the premise for the story, doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Story over continuity and and story over sense to some degree. Yeah, yeah. Even if it doesn't make that much sense, it's something that the audience. W- should be able to see something that the audience definitely wants um it's a weird thing to talk about and we're getting farther and farther away from generations as we go but i mean you you want a review of it it's bad um (laughs) (laughs) yeah i mean on some level I, i do still think it's the best of the tng movies that may be just for sort of simple stupid nerdy reasons um but you know it's not great yeah. Um, one question I have is, why the hell do the Star Trek movies use so much footage from themselves? Um, I don't know, because they reuse the the effect shot of um, the Klingon ship being blown up from the end of the previous movie. Yeah, they do that, and then there's... Um, which, it's weird the Klingon ships don't evolve at all. Yeah. Uh, it's a, but, I mean, it's because Star Trek's a cheap sci-fi show, and they have to recycle a lot of stuff. Yeah, but it's it's weird because, like, in the second movie, they use a lot of shots the fir- from the uh, beauty passes in the first movie. Mm-hmm. And then the 
a bunch of shots from the first movie just show, keep showing up within the franchise, of, of the films at least. So I always thought that was really weird. We're going to get our money's worth. I guess. Like ten years later in some cases, or more. Um, that's really weird. Anyway. Uh, I don't know. Like Ultimately, I just I think this movie is, is a huge disappointment, and that's probably its biggest crime. N- besides just being bad... It's also disappointing on top of that. Um, yeah, like, it's a movie like, where Kirk and Picard team up, and it's not a good movie. Yeah, like, it, it seems like, like we've said, there's so many things you could have done with that, and they did none of those things. It's it's especially weird to put Kirk in so late in the film, too. Um, yeah. Because you think part of the fun would, would have having all these characters interact long-term, and you probably could have gotten more of the original series crew back with that premise. Yeah, you kind of show them together in the beginning. You see how they don't jive in the middle, and then they have to get their shit together for the finale to save the day. Yeah, I mean, it's it's basic story. It would have been a little cliche, but it, it's, again, it's Star Trek. It would have worked better than which, this. Yeah, it's Star Trek. What you want, what you always enjoy is the character thing, and the only reason to make a movie like this is to see the characters together. Um, like, you know, even if it was just, you know, Romulans again, I wouldn't have cared. It would have been fun to see these characters interact. That's what, th- that's what's selling the ticket. That's what your movie's sold on. And instead, you're just getting something that's, you know, not good with barely any interaction between these characters. Um, so that's always disappointing. Well, but and, apparently, and like the poster says two captains, one destiny, and it's like, that has nothing to do with the movie. I didn't know that. That's funny. Um, I do have one side note, though. If you want to survive into the future in the Star Trek universe, all you have to do is be a member of the original Enterprise. Um, like a big cast name member. That's all you had to do. And then you'd get to live forever. Um, yeah. That's true for his Scotty... goes, too, because you can make a living giving signatures at conventions for the rest of yeah. your career. Yeah. What is Chekhov up to these days? Good question. Um, <laughs> I'd feel bad if he's dead. I hope I don't not. think he is um, yet. Yeah, I heard Scotty died. I'm like, damn, I actually like Scotty. He was a good captain. I like the episodes where Scotty got the bridge. Um, yeah. He was cool. Anyway, I think that'll about do it. Uh, did you have anything else you wanted to bring up about this movie? I know I kind of like suckered you into watching it again just to do this but it was interesting to rewatch it because like like i said like i don't really care for the tng movies um i honestly like i don't really care for probably the majority of the star trek movies all that much but um it was fun to rewatch because i i don't very often Mm, okay um let's go ahead and do a quick rating for for shits and grins um i'm gonna give this movie probably a 1.5 out of 5 Mr. Tricorders. Um, that's that's Data's little ventriloquist tricorder. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> I'm going to give it a half a, a Dura sister out of two Dura sisters. <laughs> <laughs> so one Dura sister or is it like, do they come in pairs? Um, <laughs> it, would, it would be half of Half of Lursa, I guess. Oh, okay. Is is she the one with the cleavage all the time with, the, like, the Power Girl shirt? Um, I think so. Okay, well then, as long as it's the top half, we're all good. <laughs> uh. <laughs> this was turned into our own turnabout intruder. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> it's always the weirdest... Women in, in sci-fi properties and, and comic books and geek stuff just always get the strangest costumes. Um... Anyway, like, that's not practical at all. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's another everyone, discussion. Everyone, thank you very much for listening. Until next time, I'm the Philosopher. And I'm the Enthusiast. And we are your geeky gentlemen, and we will be discussing things.